Welcome back to Sabbath Services. The beginning of the last seven years is going to start out as a triumph for mankind. We can have peace. We can get along. We've got the new world order. The Pope has given his blessing. All of the religious leaders are in agreement. Everything is just fine. We have no wars. Okay? And then there will be the miracles that will be done. And then, right in the middle of it, boom! King of the South spoils it. Okay? So interesting. Now, let's come back here to Revelation 17 and finish this off. Okay? Now, these seven kings are the ones in succession, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And you might think, well, we're not a part of the Roman Empire. Well, we're part of Babylon the Great, aren't we? Have you ever seen the architecture of the buildings in Washington, D.C.? Huh? What do they look like? They look like the buildings of ancient Rome, don't they? Yes, indeed. Okay, so you look at that chart in the back here. I have one here. And if you don't have the Daniel Revelation series, get it. Okay, so this takes us right down to the final world government. Okay, now you don't know if there's going to be a reformation of the United Nations or not. If they get involved... And think about this. The League of Nations buildings and properties in Switzerland were given to the UN when they founded it in 1945. Okay. So what if the UN moves to where the League of Nations was? They got the buildings and everything ready to go. Okay. So that's possible. Okay, let me ring my bell. See, I ring the bell whenever it's a thought and it's possible, but we don't know. Okay, so don't take it as doctrine. Verse 10. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is. Now, the one is, is when they understood it, when we began to understand what it meant. And you will see that comes to the time of World War II. And the other has not yet come. Now, isn't it interesting that this peaceful church combination starts in Germany? Okay. Okay. And when he has come, it is ordained he remained for a little while. Now, a little while doesn't give us a definite time period. So, this would have to be a little more than three and a half years. Okay? And then, the beast power continues to fight, and they all end up fighting Christ at his return. So the little while will amount to three and a half plus three and a half, or seven years. Is also the eight, but is from the seventh. So in other words, it's telling us it's going to be the same system that was under Hitler. In other words, fascism. And the great reset is fascism. Now, fascism is different than Communism, inasmuch as fascism lets all the businesses be privately owned, whereas communism is they take over all sources of production. Okay. So this helps answer why these big corporations are cooperating in this. And I saw on um, Carl Tuckerson's show, Glenn Beck, he wrote the book, The Great Reset, okay? And it's all documented, see? 
So what's interesting is this. When we're watching and looking and understanding, God will lead us to what we need to know so we can see what is taking place. All right? Now then, it says there are ten kings who received power as kings for one hour. Now, I can't find my notes that I had with it, but the United Nations has the whole world divided down into ten economic areas. North America, South America, Europe, India, China, Africa, North Africa, South Africa, and then you have the Isles of the Pacific, and then you have the Scandinavians are kind of off on the side so far. Russia is one. And so they all add up to 10 regions. Now, when this world peace comes in, will they set up a prime minister for each of these 10 areas? I don't know. Let me ring the bell. Okay. But they do not have authority as a king. But when the war starts between the king of the north and the king of the south, then these other kings receive power as kings to work with the beast to try and solve the problem. Okay, that's the best I can figure it out at this point. We don't know. But anyway, we're getting close. Verse 12, and the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not received a kingdom, but shall receive authority as kings for one hour with the beast. These all have one mind and shall give up their power and authority to the beast these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Okay? So we can see a lot of these things now really developing. So what, was, what is it that we must do? All right. Well, let's come here to the book of Mark. Book of Mark, chapter 13. This tells us what we need to do. And we will see how that is going to come about and everything that will go with it as much as we're able to. Okay? Mark 13, verse 30. Now this is talking about Mark 13 and verse 30. This is talking about the end time generation. Okay. Truly I say to you, this generation shall in no way pass away until all things have taken place. So everything we've read in the book of Revelation, the things we understand, the things we guess upon, and the things we can't figure out yet, they're all going to take place. Okay. The heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. But concerning that day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. Isn't that interesting? While he was on the earth, he didn't know. Okay. But the Father only. So he says this. Now, this is what we need to do. Take heed. Okay? Be watching. Now, we're going to have to watch, number one, ourselves. Number two, the world events that are taking place. Number three, the events taking place within the churches of God. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay? So he says, take heed, be watching, and praying. 
That's the key. Prayer, study, keeping the commandments of God, and asking God for the faith so we can continue even though we don't understand a lot of things. And we won't understand them until we see certain events take place. Now, look at what we just covered with this, with this um, Chermoskagog. <laughs> Who would have ever thought? I mean, even in the church, that they would all get together and do this. And that it would come out of Germany. What a tremendous thing. So we need to watch. For you do not know when the time is coming. It is like a man journeying to a far country and leaving his house, giving authority to his servants, to each one his work, and commanding the doorkeeper to watch. That's what we are. We're all like doorkeepers, see? Be watching, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, at evening, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, what? Okay, now let's look at something very interesting here. Let's come to Matthew 25. And here's the parable of the ten virgins. Matthew 25, and this one has been a difficult one to understand. Okay. But let's see if we can get a little more understanding of it this time and put it together with some other factors that are necessary. Okay? Let's start in verse 1, Matthew 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. And the ones who were foolish took their lamps, but they did not take oil with them. Now they had some oil in the lamp. How many of you have seen the little lamps that they had? It, it, it's like a seashell with a little lip on the end of it, and you, they put a wick in it. They had olive oil, and then they would light the end of it, and that would draw the olive oil up to keep the flame burning. Okay. Now, these, these little lamps didn't contain much oil. So they had to be replenished all the time. In order to do that, you had to have a reserve of oil so you could take care of it. All right? The ones who were foolish took their lamps, but they did not take the oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels along with their lamps. And when the bridegroom was gone a long time, they all became drowsy and slept. So what you can do is take this verse and use that to understand Revelation 2 and 3. All the churches had their problems, right? Okay. They become drowsy and slept. That means... They slacked off. They didn't continue to be zealous. Okay. But in the middle of the night, there was a cry. Middle of the night is an expression meaning when you don't know it's going to happen. Now, in the world, when they have that peace, it's going to look like a great light. But the way God sees it, that's midnight. There was a cry. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Go to meet him. 
Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. Okay. Showing they had the Holy Spirit, but spiritually they were going out. Now, do you know any who have been in the church that you've seen that happen to? Okay. Yes, indeed. And the wise answered, saying, No, lest there not be enough for us and for you, but instead go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Now, what does that mean? We've got to buy it. Well, we'll look at it in a minute. Okay. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And afterwards, the other virgins came, also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. So these are the ones who completely lost the Spirit of God. Some of them had a little bit of the Spirit of God. And we'll see what Jesus says in just a minute here. So he says, Watch therefore, for you do not know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Okay. Now let's come to Revelation 3. Let's follow this along with buy. Okay. Go to those who sell. Revelation 3. Let's come to verse 14. Probably knew where I was going. Okay. But let's examine it here. Now, this is part of the churches of God. And in our day and in our time, they have been beaten up <laughs> in how many different sermons, okay, by how many different ministers. And then as time goes by, you look back and see some of those preachers that preached against it themselves fell victim. See? Okay, so let's pick it up, verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginner of the creation of God. I know your works. See? Now stop and think for a minute. Everybody has works. All right? If you have no work, that no work is your work. Okay? That you are neither cold nor hot. That means you're not totally unconverted, but you're not really converted. And we can look the effect of what happened with the church through that as well. So then because you are lukewarm, and are neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Okay. Verse 17. For you say, I am rich. Now look at the other six churches. They didn't talk back to God. See. Now it takes a lot of gall to talk back to God, doesn't it? I'm rich. You've given us everything. Okay. Now, you can look at some of the churches of God, and you could say that you can identify some of them with this. Look at some of the Protestants and say, they have the name of Jesus. They have some truth. And they're rich and increased with goods. But they're not really converted. Okay. 
So what's possible? Again, I ring my bell. Okay. And I've become wealthy. Now think about all the evangelists on TBN that have jets. There's one who has four. Okay. Now figure out how much it costs to run the jets. Okay. And I've become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not understand that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I counsel you to buy, like it was told to five foolish virgins, buy from me. So that's the one that they were to go to, to buy, to Christ. See? Buy from me gold purified by fire so that you may be rich. And white garments that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve so that you may see. Okay. Because you come up to some of them in the churches of God and they don't understand and you, you come up to some of these like the evangelicals, they see certain things but they don't know anything. Okay. For as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That shows it's close to the end time. Okay. If anyone hears my voice, how do you hear the voice of God? Reading the word of God, believing the word of God, repenting and keeping the word of God. And opens the door, I will come into him. Ha, huh, what does that tell us? They had God's spirit with them, but not in them. See? I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Okay. Now, let's look at it in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. And let's see the gold that they are to buy is character. Love, truth, obedience, and all of that. Okay? 1 Corinthians 3. Okay? And let's see what Paul wrote about this and show that what we're talking about now applies to a group of people, but to each one individually within that group. Okay? So here, 1 Corinthians 3. Let's pick it up here beginning in verse 10. As a wise architect, according to the grace of God that was given to me, I have laid the foundation, and another is building upon it. But let each one take heed how he builds upon it. Okay? Our Christian life is likened to building. What kind of building are we building? See? And that comes through where we saw in Mark, be watching and praying. Watching is watch yourself, watch the world events, look at things around you, understand what you are doing, and praying. Okay? Take heed how he builds upon it. For no one is able to lay any other foundation besides that which had been laid, which is Jesus Christ. And if anyone builds upon this foundation, all right, here we go. Six different categories of spiritual building. Number one, gold. What did Jesus tell the Laodiceans? Buy of me what? Gold tried in the fire. Okay. Silver, precious stone. Now, when you look at all three of these, they're actually made better when they're under the pressure of fire. 
and can be purified. Get rid of the dross out of the gold and the dross out of the silver and the precious stones become far more valuable when they have had the right amount put upon it so that they turn out as diamonds and as rubies and as sapphires and as topaz, okay? All the stones of color back there in Revelation 22. All right? The next three are wood. Now, wood can withstand a certain amount of heat and not really be burned up, just kind of scorched a little bit. Hay. Well, that can't resist fire at all. Stubble. Stubble can even explode on a hot day. Okay? Showing that these three are not stable. So notice what he says in verse 13. The work of each one shall be manifested, for the day of trial will declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall prove what kind of work each one's is. Okay. So that's what we're facing in this age. In other words, we're going to come to a time. That's why we need to be watching and always overcoming as we're going along, because we're going to come to a time when there are going to be a lot of people who are going to say, oh, no, look at this. I should have done what the Bible says, but they were too slack. Okay. So how are they going to make it? Well, the only way they're going to make it is if they are faithful unto death. Okay, the only way. Fire shall prove it. If the work of that anyone has built endures, he shall receive a reward. If the work of anyone is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet is through fire. Okay, so this says that there is hope. So those in Matthew 25 who were the foolish They've got to come to Christ and come to Christ on his terms and receive his spirit. Okay? Now, verse 16. Don't you understand that you are God's temple and the spirit of God is dwelling in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God shall destroy him because the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So then he gives a final warning. And this all has to do with us watching ourselves. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks himself to be wise in this world, let him become a fool so that he may be wise in God's sight. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he entraps the wise in their own craftiness. Okay. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, do not let anyone boast in men, for all things are yours. And the last two verses, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God okay so there we go let's take another look at this let's come to Isaiah 55 now this is why prophecy is interesting everyone wants to know but the truth is 
If you don't keep your spiritual house in order, you're not going to understand. Isaiah 55, verse 1. Ho, everyone who thirsts. See. Now, the five foolish virgins were not thirsting like they should. See. Now, what does it mean to thirst? It means this. You desire the word of God. You desire the spirit of God. God will give it. Okay. But when you're lukewarm, when you're not applying yourself, and when you're deceiving yourself and telling yourself, well, I'll get around to it here pretty quick, and then time slips away. And you'd say, well, I'll get around to it pretty quick. And time slips away. And lo and behold, time takes its toll. And then your self-deception becomes even worse. Come to the waters, and he who has no money, come. Buy and eat. Yea, come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Okay, all of these are aspects of the word of God. God will give you understanding. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for what never satisfies? Hearken diligently to me. That's what it has to be. And this is our own charge to each one of us. God wants us to be diligent. That means we continue steadfast in prayer, steadfast in study, let nothing interfere with it, let nothing take us away from God, let nothing supersede our desire and what we're called to do, but to serve God. Now notice what it says here. Okay. Hearken diligently to me and eat what is good. Okay. Now the psalm says, Oh, taste and see the Lord is good. That means the word of God. Okay. So whenever you're studying the word of God, you're feeding your mind. See? And that's what needs to be fed more than your belly. See? Because you need the Spirit of God to direct you, and God will provide enough for your belly. Okay, if we can put it that way. All right. And let your soul delight itself in fatness, that is, understanding the deep things of God. Bow down your ear and come to me. Now, isn't that what Revelation 3, the Laodiceans is? Yes, right there. And here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Okay? So there we go. That's what we need to be doing. All right, is there anything else we missed? Nope, let's come back to Romans, the eighth chapter. Let's finish it here. Romans 8. All this tells us what we need to be doing. This reminds me, every time there's a big rain someplace, the news always goes out there and watches the swelling river rise and rise. When they get record rains, everyone who had the Riverside house are standing there wondering, Will my house survive? And you've seen the picture of it, haven't you? The water increases and here's their house. Whew. And it just goes down the torrent of the river that's swollen. So we need to be careful that that doesn't happen to us. Now, Let's pick it up here in verse 9. Romans 8 and verse 9. 
This is what we need to focus on. See. You are not in the flesh. In other words, God is looking upon us with his spirit in us as if we're spiritual. But in the spirit, if the spirit of God is indeed dwelling within you. Now, remember what we read with the Laodiceans. Okay. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone opens, I will come into him. Okay. They need to have the spirit of God. Okay. If the spirit of God is indeed dwelling in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. But if Christ is within you, the body is indeed dead because of sin. However, the spirit is life because of righteousness. That means you're not letting your body, your mind, control you in the dictates of the lust of the carnal mind. But the Holy Spirit of God is leading you, strengthening you, and showing you what you need to do where you need to go. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling within you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies because of the spirit that dwells within you. So you see the whole thing about it. And the whole thing about prophecy is, yes, it's interesting. Yes, it's going to happen exactly like God says. Yes, it is true. But because you can see it, you can understand some of it. What's the most important thing? The Spirit of God within you, because that points toward the resurrection. Okay? Verse 12. So then, brethren, you are not debtors to the flesh, flesh to live according to the flesh, because if you are living according to the flesh, you shall die. But if, by the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And that's what it has to be with us. Now, we could go on and add other scriptures to it, which help us understand and give us inspiration. But this is what we need to do when we see all of these events coming up upon us. So we'll end the stream of prophecy by saying, watch yourself. Watch world events. Okay? And God will be with you in everything that you do.